My peoples, my peoples, my peoples, we are back with another edition of Goat Talk. And today in the building with me, special, special, special friend of mine represents the same neighborhood I grew up in from Flatbush, Brooklyn, Mr. Special Ed. Yes, sir. My yes, brother, sir. great Peace. to see you, man. Great to see you. Thanks for having it's me, a man. Great it's blessing an honor to see and a you. privilege to still be uh, remembered and of course. thought of in, in these times, in these days where it's, you know, cookie cutter out here. You know yeah, we mean? can it's never a, forget you. Yeah, man, no, I appreciate that. You were that. too important for us. You yes, know what sir. I mean? So talk to me about the temperature and the, the environment, what it was like coming out at such a young age. What were you, about 16 years old? Yeah, when the record dropped, I was 16. When I recorded it, I was 15. Look at that. Yeah, I went over to Hitman Howie T. Hitman Howie That's T. That's my guy. Man, shouts to Howie T, man. I love you, bro. So basically, he was the man in the neighborhood. He produced everybody. Absolutely. He was the one that was the known uh, industry guy. That's and, it. And, and record producer to put people on. So I, I went to him. He lived across the street from my cousins, my first cousins. Okay. And I asked my cousin, yo, Jennifer, you know, tell Howie I want to come rap. I want him to hear me because by that time I was tearing the streets up in Flatbush. That's know, what's up. From school, from Erasmus Hall, mm -hmm. other schools, the streets, you know what I'm saying? I was spitting everywhere. So I was like, okay, I'm ready to record. Since we are celebrating 50 years of hip hop, right? Yeah. Can you remember your first initial memory of hip hop period? Man, my first uh, memories of hip hop was um, probably like a uh, Grandmaster Flash, Furious Five, Sugar Hill Gang, the Sugar Hill Gang, and um, Jimmy Spicer, more particularly. Rest in peace to Jimmy Spicer. He was probably the most influential uh, to me as a, as a person and as an artist because when he came out with Super Rhymes, we had the wax. I had the wax. My mother, one Christmas, got a Fisher-Price phonograph for me and my brother to share. I have four brothers, but the one that's one year older, we shared everything pretty much. So she got us a, a, the gift to share. So we used to get records and put them on. And my older brothers bought records and my father had records. And for some reason, we ended up with the, the wax. We had Jimmy Spicer, Super Rhymes. And that, that was like 15 minutes long. Shout out to Jimmy Spicer, man, because he probably, you know, that that's one of the records that brought out uh, the wittiness, the storytelling, right. and the need to want to amuse my listener. Because when I listened to Super Rhymes, I was like, yo, that's funny. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. And um, and then, you know, going into uh, like the message, that, that brought the serious side of rap out. So between that and that, I think those are my biggest influences and memories of rap. And then, of course, you know, Soul Sonic Force and uh, Planet Rock. Yeah, that's the record that made me fall in love with hip hop. You yeah. know, Africa Bambata Soul and the Soul Sonic, Sonic Force, Force Planet, Rock, Planet yeah. Rock. When I had that vinyl, my, it was my dad's vinyl. It wasn't mine because right. I, didn't, I didn't have no money back then. But right. So it was my dad's vinyl. And I would play it. And my dad, honestly, my dad would be like, don't touch my turntable. Right. <laughs> but every time he went to work, I would sneak and I would. Throw it on. I would throw it on. And I'd, I'd be uh, with my headphones on all day, just playing the record, playing the record. And then I'd be like, Dad, be home soon. And I'd have to put the record back and clean it and wipe it down and, <laughs> and make sure I, I wipe it so there's no fingerprints on right. it. It's just so crazy how we had the a, things we had to do right. to enjoy a song. But see, uh, what happened was my pops had the system, you know, the little shelf of system course, with yeah. the turntable and of the course. app. And everything. So we couldn't touch that. That's But we used to touch it. So that's why we ended up getting our own Fisher Price you. phonograph. Yeah, so we he used gave to you that. Like, Y'all gonna play with this. You're right. not touching my system. But then we could play with all the records. My biggest problem was my older brothers would come and they would start scratching on my Fisher Price phonograph, and mm -hmm. I ain't really like that because I felt like they was Disres messing up my like needle. disrespecting your yeah, thing. Yeah, it was disrespecting <laughs> my shit. So I was like. <laughs> I would complain about that, but you know we used to call it zooping. You know, zoop, zoop, zoop. That's what's yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Flatbush in 1983, 84, 85, 86. What was it like for you? Um, Flatbush in them times was a very uh, kind of hostile place, man. Like, Facts. I lived on Church Avenue. I know exactly where that's at. One block from Nostra Nav and um, actually one block from Jerk Chicken. And mm -hmm. if anybody from Brooklyn knows about Jerk Chicken, mm -hmm. then you understand that's where that's the origin of, like, weed hustling in, in, in the street. 
uh, kind of, sort of, you know what I'm saying? So it was a big area for that. And I live right in the middle of all of that, between the train station and jerk chicken. You so, sure did. Yeah, so basically growing up was just really interesting to see things unfold, everything unfold right there on Church Avenue. Thousands of people commuted every day right past my house. All the time. So we was able to kind of observe, grow up in that light. And it taught me a, a way to analyze and be able to kind of understand people mm -hmm. and, and really read people. You know what I'm saying? Who's who, what's me too. what. You know what I'm saying? So it's easy for me. I could be around thousands of people and feel very comfortable in my skin and, and, and know how to navigate and, and what's what and who's That's who. what's up. Yeah. For me, I grew up in, you know, the Low East Side, the first 10, 15 years of my life. And then I moved to Flatbush. Yeah. So coming from the projects in the Low East Side, it was very American black and then heavy Latino, right? Mm -hmm. So I go to Flatbush and it's culture shock for me now all, all because Indian. all West Indian, everybody's <laughs> Haitian, Guyanese, Jamaican, yeah. I'm Bayesian, you know, Trini. And I'm, yeah. But you know what it did for me? Mm -hmm. It gave me an extra edge as a disc jockey because I had additional soundtracks to my life yeah. that I didn't have previously. Awareness too. So then when I would go to these clubs or sets or whatever I'm doing my thing when, when it was time to do the dance hall thing it was in my backyard every knew. day every day you hear because you're going window. you're going up and down Flatbush you're hearing it every day because I went to Huddy okay Copy. all right and then I went to Erasmus High School for night school right and then I saw the I was I was saying this to him off mic before when I first saw the movie Wild Style I saw it at the Kenmore Theater on Church Avenue. Mm -hmm. yep. I cut out of school specifically to go see that with my crew, and we probably went about thirty forty deep just to go see that movie. Yeah, and it changed my life, and I, I figured that's when everything happened. And then you talked about Hitman Howie T. So Howie T, Professor Paul, Greg, and um, Elliot ESP. ESP. Remember yeah. them? Yep. Okay, so Paul taught me how to scratch and DJ. Oh, nice. I would be in his basement all the time just trying to cut and scratch and chops, and they were crazy. Paul was like a, a five foot ten black belt. Of course he, master. of course he was, <laughs> of course he was. He was Shout nasty out to with ESP, it. Man, Shout to them. Paul and them, yeah, man. And then I went to high school with Chub Rock. I mean, yeah. junior high. We went yeah, to that's we, all, how he's we, all, we all went to the same. So it's all. Like, those would have, to me, the founding fathers of Flatbush Hip Hop. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Um, we used to see Howie coming down the Ave. Howie was like a hood star. He was of a course. hero. He used to have a fur hat with the raccoon tail in the back. And you wore stuff like that out, <laughs> out in the hood, man. You was on, like, you was like, you were oh, special. Yeah, the little that dude's special. That. Yeah, yeah. He's so, special, man. Yeah, so that's that. We looked up to guys like Howie T and, um, Obviously, when I got of age and, you know, had a little confidence to say I'm ready, because at that point, I felt like I was ready to compete with anybody, the best of them, mm -hmm. the best of the best, because that's what I did. I went to school. I went to school and battled everybody. I walked down the street, battled everybody. I went to parties, battled everybody. And I did very well. You know what I'm saying? I, I ain't never really had problems. You did so, your thing. Yeah. So by that time, I was like, yo, Howie, come on, man. I'm ready. And um and everybody thought special ed was Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know cuz I grew up uh it, well in Flatbush and there's all kinds of uh nationalities yes. and ethnicity. So I got everything from Trinidad, Guyana, um Dominican, mm -hmm. Puerto Rican. Yes, sir. I got everything but they you know, except Jamaican. They didn't they, they wouldn't guess that. You know That's because you probably was rocking a, a little fade back then with a little Now I had designs. my hair wild back you know then I mean? when I, I was little. In, in it was the wilder? 80s. Yeah, in the 80s. Okay. It, you know, it was a whole different thing. And I tell you what, too. Um, well, in the 70s, it was a little wilder because the Caribbean and West Indian community was um, pretty much the Americans used to kind of pit against them. They used to call them, you know, forgot what they used to say banana boat and all that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. all that kind of crap but then it used to cause you know ruckus and then there was kind of like an uprising around the 70s where it was like we, we ain't nobody having that shit. no we're not having so that no more they basically took over the whole community and merged and it was like you either get down or get down you feel me so that's it so that's when the caribbean kind of influence took over the area but i remember like even when my brothers first came from jamaica i was already living here it was uh, some tension between Americans accepting the influx of the Caribbean movement Always. In, in Flatbush and in Brooklyn. So, yeah, that was a thing.
Now it's done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember it was even big thing with the, with Haitians. You know what I'm saying? For I remember a long, that too. Long time. I remember that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, we we all went through our struggles with identity and ethnicity, being and, immigrants. Yeah, yeah. Cultural here. differences, but we all tapped in and came together, and that's what made the community good. Because even on the one block I lived on, 31st and Church, this Fairview place. We had uh, a, a white family that still lived on the corner. We had black Americans across the street. We was Jamaican. We had Africans down the block. We had Puerto Ricans across the street. And then we had one house where the Haitians rented to the Dominicans. Right. So we just had a whole melting pot that's it. on one block. So, mm -hmm. you know, th that's what the whole community was basically like. And it taught you how to accept people's differences. Absolutely. And still love them and still move forward together in unity. When did when did you feel like, you know what, I made it, I'm here? Um, I feel like I made it when I got my little first $1,500 check from Profile to do the album. Okay, that's what's up. That's <laughs> I, think what's out up. Of, I think it was 15000 and then out of everything and all the deductions and costs... I got like a fifteen hundred dollar check, and that was the biggest money I ever got. So he was like, "Yes, in my life." I was like fifteen hundred dollars, and I'm like fifteen years old. That's it. So I'm like, "Man, forget." That's this. like me. I did my first party. They gave me three hundred dollars, <laughs> and I was like, "Yo, for three hundred dollars, I'll do this for free." Right. That's how I felt at the time because that's right. how much I love the craft yeah. and I love the culture. You know what I'm saying? But we here is talking to Special Ed. This is Go Talk. Yeah, peace. So give me something that. Maybe people or your fans don't know about you. I know that's, that's, that's a weird question, but I know you have it in you. Man, everything that even transpired prior to me even coming out. You understand? <laughs> okay. Yeah. My, my whole, my whole uh, upbringing, my school stuff. You know what I'm saying? Special ed, the name where it came from and, and the school situation. So basically, um, how I got the name Special Ed was I went through all the names. I went through Eddie Love, Ed Ski. Eddie Ed, and one day my boy E Dot was like, "Yo, man, you should call yourself Special Ed." And I was, I thought about it for a minute, and I ain't know whether I should like, I, if if he was being funny or he was being for real or whatever. And I thought about it for two seconds, and I was like, "You know what? You absolutely right." Because in school, I was always like the mayor. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. That was always my personality. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a little skinny kid, but I was I was a live one. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And and that's how I um got my name in the community and that's how I got out there as even as an artist. Even like when I came into Erasmus Hall High School, I did that shit jail style. I, I looked for the the best MC in the school. I was like, Yeah, where he at? And then when I found him, um, I battled him. I was like, Yo, what's up? Mm -hmm. You nice? Okay, well, let's go. <laughs> let's so go. I'm coming out of junior high. I'm a freshman, and he already, you know, he the man in school. Everybody think he going to tear me up. So you went right for it. Man, I went right for him jail style and took <laughs> him out. So what we did was we battled for identity. So we battled for namesake. So mm. if when, he lost, and I took his name. Mm. So he couldn't use the name anymore. Mm. You understand? Mm -hmm. And um, I, ain't, I ain't, well, his name was prince at the time but after that battle it was no longer prince wow you know what i'm saying so i took his identity just coming into the school so that's how i set the tone is that considered flatbush style that's considered flatbush style you feel me and because I, on the mission record you say um i fought him flatbush, I fought him flatbush style. style so i was like what does flatbush style mean flatbush style is Do you hit him with a on him you act, or you act like yeah, yeah. Whoop, whoop. You act like you you know something, something going on, and you just fake on them and blah. I love it. So you know we that's how I entered into the school, and then I became like the mayor of my high school. And you know this was a time ridden with our own gang issues and violence, and you know they used to come up to the school and rob kids every day, knock right. people out for no reason, right. like you know. So I, in that um, we used to riot with the police, mm -hmm. like riot with the police. They had no respect for uh, you know uniform officers you know what i'm saying unless it's you crazy was a, unless you was a fed or a detective they ain't really care you know what i'm saying they laugh at a patrol you know foot you know foot draggers but um that that's what it was all the whole time but my last year of school man um it all unfolded for me man and and it changed the course and trajectory of my whole my whole vibe man because uh I, I was in the school 
and they got a new security team that was supposed to come and clean up the school. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm walking to class or whatever, and this new security guy that I didn't know, I knew all the security, man. I used to go to the store for them. Yo, I'm, I'll be back with your need. That type of thing. Right. There was all love because I came up in a school popular. So he was like, yo, where you going? I'm like, yo, I'm going to class. Well, who, who are you? You know what I'm saying? Because he was brand new. He was like, oh, let me see your schedule. Schedule? I, I don't even carry no schedule. What are you talking about? Like, who carries a schedule? So I'm like, yo, I'm going to my class, man. You know, ease up. So he's like, nah, he tried to stop me from moving. From, from, from going to class? So I'm like, yeah, from going to class. So I kind of moved them off for me like, yo, what is you doing, bro? And then he start calling back up, talking about, Joe, you going down. You going down, bop, bop, bop. And then they searched me. And you know what I'm saying? I had a little thing, you know what I'm saying? A little, little whatever. So, you know, I got that charge. I got the felony charge for the assault on an officer. And, um, you know, I got a superintendent suspension. And at that point, man, I, that was my last year of high school, too. And you're like, damn, now? Yeah, bro. Out of all the times, out now? Of, exactly. And then, um, you know, I spent the weekend in jail or whatever. And then when I got out, they, they sent me to Tilden. Mm. Tilden High School. And when I got in Tilden High School, obviously somebody must have read my record and figured out that there was an, ass a, 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 an assault on an officer. So mm -hmm. the school officer over there start fucking with me. He goes and handcuff me and uh, bring me in an office and, you know, start. he beat me about the face. Like, yeah, for real. Um, abuse. That's child abuse. That's I was, crazy. I was 15 years old, yeah. So my whole shit was swole up, and he walked me out to school in handcuffs. So this is the second time now. I just come from this in the other school, and this guy tried to do the same thing. His name is Officer Lopez. So anybody out there, holla at your boy, man. Officer Lopez. Damn, Officer Lopez. He's an asshole. That's horrible, man. Yeah, so because of the record, he brings me in the office and, you know, swole my shit up. So... He's driving to the, um, he's driving to the precinct. Tell you what he did. He driving to the precinct, and I was like, "Yeah, all right, we gonna see how this play out." You know what I'm saying? I'm taking pictures. We gonna see how this all play out. You a big bad man with with, with a little kid with handcuffs on, right? Okay. So I'm talking, talking. Next thing you know, he stops on Snyder and Thirty First, which is a block from my house, mm -mm -mm. and he's like, "Yo." He's like, you can run your mouth and you can go back to see the same judge and go to jail. Or you could get your ass out of here and shut your mouth. I was like, yo, let me out in the car, man. So he uncuffs me, let me out the car, and I just walked home. I was like, fuck it. I left it alone. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because it was better to take that route than for me to go right back through the system and have some other charge and see the same judge and I was on probation mm. for what happened in Erasmus. That's crazy. And to, to be honest, man, you know, it wasn't even that type of situation. I didn't assault the man. I just got him off of me. Got you. You feel me? So that's how they do black children in the system, in the society. And it happened to me. So that's how I know. So when I see them out here shooting 14 year old black kids, Every day, I already know what it is. It's mm -hmm. systematic. Yep. This has been going on for decades. Yep. Since I was a child, since I was 15 years old, 100%. going through the same thing, going through the system. Why you put me through the system? I'm saying systematic. For you going to school. Right. For me going to going school. Going to class. So, so you You're know. You're already in school. Right. So after that, man, that's when the record came out and pretty much took off. But by then, you know, I had a, a, a not just a, that record, but a school record as like, um, you know, truancy and, and shit like that. So I went in there with my parents and tried to sort things out and get a tutor. Right. They told me I couldn't get a tutor. Why? They told, they told me because of my record and because of my uh, attendance record wow. that I would have to come to school every single day or else I was going to fail. Wow. And they would leave me back. So I was like, okay, so what options do I have? And they say, well, you could take a GED or you're going to have to just come to school every day. So I was like, all right, well, where's the GED at? Let me get that. 
and I went and took the GED ASAP. I got my GED before my class graduated. Mm. I took the test early. You just want to get yourself out the system right. so that we can do you. I want to get myself out the system, out the school, and out the peril of this whole mm -hmm. system, man. It's like they was trying to railroad me. And, and, I, and that's what they do to all black males, young black males. And um, I wasn't even greatly successful yet. I just started my career. Just started, right. But I was doing shows, and I was getting more money than I ever seen. That's what's up. So I was like, yo, I'll, buy, I'll pay for a tutor. And they wouldn't let me do that. Mm. So I just went and took my GD, man. I, you know, I don't really have no regrets about that because um, I don't really revere the educational system. They ain't even telling the truth. So right. at the end of the day, I ain't paying to be lied to regardless. So I'm good, man. Got but, you. You know, that's where, that's how this whole special ed thing kind of unfolds. And it's a 360 kind of thing for me. It's like, you know, it means a lot. So you can honestly say that hip hop saved your life to a certain degree. Absolutely hip hop saved my life because otherwise, you know, I really don't know what I would be doing especially with them out here trying to railroad me and, and put things on my record and, and turn me into a monster. That's crazy. You know Did saying? you ever talk about any of those in your raps? Um, Some nah, of those you situations? Know I or never no? really talked about that stuff, period, because I didn't want to include negative parts of my life or upbringing in my career. Gotcha. You know, I was seen as, you know, this uh, uh, whatever, this... This this young, vibrant, uh, handsome young man from right. Brooklyn, That's right. you know, sex symbol, whatever. And I didn't want to turn, you know, turn the whole thing into, yo, this is the real, we'll, 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 we'll have people looking at me whatever way. Right. And actually, they even censored some of my music. Like, the mission was not the original mission. No? The original mission we recorded was a story about me in action getting revenge on uh, a local guy in the hood and his crew mm. right but it was a little graphic you know what i'm saying and they they was like they didn't want that image they didn't want the language it was too early yeah it was and violence. gangster rap wasn't really popular yet there wasn't no there was no gangster, gangster rap. rap not yet so that story they they told me to change it up or do something else so that's when i wrote part two so the mission that you hear on the record is actually part two. Got it. Yeah. Wow, that's good. I didn't even know that. See, and I'm and I'm a hip hop head for real, for real. Yeah, that's Thank you for that. Two, Thank you yeah. for sharing that for me, man. Yeah, I appreciate you. So, fifty years of hip hop is here. I know you do a lot of uh, elder statesman shows and that kind of stuff. And I know sometimes you behind the scenes actually helping artists and booking DJs and booking shows because you put money in my pocket. Amen. Um. What's exciting about 50 Years of Hip Hop to you? Um, well, just being recognized and being respected as an industry, as a culture, and as pioneers. Like It's almost like now we're actually getting the respect that we deserve for so long because we've been the highest grossing, selling genre forever. Yep. You know, unsaid, but now it's being said and it's known. We out streaming every other genre and, and class, not, I wouldn't say classic, I would say original or, you know, traditional rap, not even the new stuff. Mm -hmm. We are doing the most and doing the best. So that needs to be recognized and we need to be um, appreciated and honored just like in rock and roll, just like in blues, just like in jazz. We want the same respect. You know Absolutely. What I'm just like pop because if we're outselling these artists we're creating more revenue there should be more for everybody yeah. more right more respect more sponsorships more more appreciation 100 percent. i'm glad accolades. you're here man thank you for coming here man you're my guy yeah no worries there's always man. a special place in my heart for you mr ed i appreciate that man like i always tell you there's only one truth man so that's it anytime bro that's what's up bro go talk you heard we here special ed dj enough until next time